One of the oldest ecosystems in North America were the vast native river cane habitats that stretched for miles across the American Southeast. Once large enough to cover 50 square miles in areas, now barely 1% of that original ecosystem remains. Largely patches and disconnected from its larger function, native river cane still survives, but barely. This has impacted everyone from indigenous communities who use native river cane for basket making and traditional purposes. Some people speculate that the loss of the vast cane breaks contributed to the loss of important species, such as the passenger pigeon and the Swainson warbler. Other threatened and endangered species, such as the Florida panther and Louisiana black bear, still thrive in what remains of this degraded ecosystem. Well, I like to tell people my first experience with, with river cane was with switch cane when I was bad with my grandma. Uh, so I got to know it really well. You'd have to pick your own cane switch when I was a kid. This project is a result of many years of collaboration between university partners, tribal governments, private corporations, river cane experts just really kind of come together through a group called the River Cane Restoration Alliance. And CONSERVE, our research group, is supporting that alliance in both the science and cultural restoration aspects and conservation aspects of native river cane. The following presentation shows the results of this partnership and hopefully helps spread the good word on native river cane ecosystems as they support water quality, erosion control, critical habitat, stream bank stabilization, wildlife corridors, and cultural lifeways of native peoples. I'm Patrick Hamlin. I'm in the uh, engineering department at the Westervelt Company. Uh, we handled the stream construction back in the summer of uh, 2023 on this uh, mitigation project. Uh, we're back in here today looking at uh, any damage that we would have had prior or post rain event, bank full event. And uh, for the most part, I think we're looking good. We are seeing a few areas that are gonna need some uh, tender loving care to get it back to where it needs to be, but this is part of the process. Seen it post uh, mowing and post prescribed fire. So yes, I have done some work with it, but um, never I've never transplanted it and never I've never propagated it in any way. Just just manipulated existing populations. So it's exciting exciting to see this process, and I've learned a lot in the last couple of days. That's the goal, I think, with all this, you know. You know, this doesn't, from our company's standpoint, this doesn't generate any uh, credits for us. We sell mitigation credits, um, but we're doing this because, you know, some of our, our company's mission is to be good stewards of the land, and we want to do that. And this, it, this was so easy. Mike and Thomas have been so great. You know, it was a no-brainer for us to get to do this. So, I mean, this project has been to Oklahoma to pull cane samples. It's been to Louisiana, Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, not just to better understand uh, this plant that we're trying to restore, but also to cultivate allies and experts and traditional knowledge keepers to better inform this restoration. It also has a lot of cultural properties as well. It's part of several Southeastern native tribes cosmology and religion, ceremonial practices. It also is used for traditional crafting among several native people. So there's a very strong relationship between river cane as both a natural and a cultural resource. Biologically, it is a bamboo, but it's native to North America, which is very special. A lot of the bamboos you see in around urban areas and things, or the bamboos that have a bad reputation for taking over forested areas, those most often are introduced from other countries. A lot of them come from Japan or China, but this is our own native bamboo species. 
There's a variety of birds that um, warblers, specifically the Swainson's warbler, that is, you know, pretty uncommon, use river cane as habitat. And then there's also pollinators. There's, there's moths and butterflies that only lay their eggs and their larvae only eat river cane. That's why it's considered a keystone species. There's an entire ecology that's supported by river cane. Very few plants need a public relations team. However, very few plants have seen their wholesale destruction on landscape level like native river cane. Rundinaria gigantea often gets confused for its invasive cousin, Chinese golden bamboo. The two are quite different for many reasons. First, invasive bamboo does not provide the same ecosystem services to native habitats and wildlife that native river cane does. Second, native river cane ecosystems take much longer to grow and propagate. And finally, native river cane is a cultural keystone species important to the lifeways of many indigenous groups in the American Southeast, whereas golden bamboo is not. We're working with the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, but we're also working with the United Katua Band of Cherokee, the Gina Band of Choctaw, uh, and the Mississippi Band of Choctaw on the Greater River Cane Initiative. So, but primarily for this specific restoration site, this would be the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Stabilize a, an eroding bank out here. Um, I think there's, there could be implications in any kind of stormwater management, erosion control, possibly even wastewater systems if it were integrated, because river cane can handle a lot of fertility, um, and it's been proven effective at mitigating agricultural runoff. Southern Illinois University has done studies on the uptake of nitrates and phosphates, and its use as an agricultural buffer. I started from basically ground zero when we came out yesterday, and I'm just, I can't believe how much I've learned. And you know, it's easy to, we see cane all over when we're walking around some of our projects. So now, now we know how to take care of that in a, you know, kind of a passive way, just opportunistically. So I think that's something that Franklin over there and I and, and Seth, the other guy who couldn't be here this week, but who's been really active in, in getting this put together so far, is something really easy we can do going forward here and at other sites. So mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's awesome that we get to take that with us. <laughs> One big misconception is that it needs to be right against a river or right in, in water or near water, that's not necessarily true. It really thrives on the first levy of waterways and that's where it provides a special service of, you know, when floodwaters do arise, it combs out debris out of the water and deposits it right, right at its feet versus say a forested buffer where, you know, floodwaters scour through and, and then when the waters recede, it's just mud. River cane traps everything right there and deposits it. So it's great at accreting soil in um, any kind of areas that are near water, not necessarily in water. And I mean, if you wanted to, you could plant a patch in your backyard. It really does there's not a lot of limiting factors. When someone's there to take care of it, it'll do, usually do well. Right now, this will be the largest river cane restoration project in the state of Alabama, and I suspect in the tri-state area. We're trying several different techniques on this site, everything from clump division and replanting to uh, stand enhancement techniques, fertilization, um, targeted and selective thinning, so we hope to demonstrate over time that these enhance the, these types of uh, wetland restoration projects, primarily these stream restorations, by preventing sediment buildup within the streams, erosion, and this sort of thing, while also providing wildlife habitat. So in terms of a broader sense, if this works, right, it's a pretty low risk, low cost, um, an effective way to get the most ecosystem service benefit out of a restoration project. So we're hoping that this is sort of the pilot restoration for the greater southeast. If you've got river cane, you know, on one of your properties, it'd be, it is a real asset and it's worth paying attention to and managing for, for its health.